you had a tuna field operation in Australia? Micronesia. But yeah, my territory went from South America, Central America, all the way to Indonesia, towards Alaska, and every island nation there is in the Pacific. Montana. What about Montana? Too dang cold. Mike? You got him. Hey, what's up, Mike? Hey, man. You got the real worldwide Murdoch the Hillbilly Vagabond on with you right now. I got to say, repeat, repeat that for me. The real live Murdoch the Hillbilly Vagabond with you right now. The real live Murdoch Hillbilly Vagabond. That's you. That's right. Uh, uh, well, what's your story, Murdoch the Vagabond? Well, that's what's probably mind-blowing. Most of it sounds absolutely unbelievable, but I got pictures to prove it. Uh, just pick a region of the world, maybe, and we can start there. Or I can go any, back into my... Any region of the world? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I've pretty much lived everywhere. I, I was kind of a crazy hillbilly entrepreneur back in the day. Uh, pre Any region of the world? Yeah, except the, All right. uh, and you know, I'll go there one day, but but not been All right. there yet. All right. All right. Um, Ireland. Well, only place in Ireland I've been was Shannon. The green was grass was super green and the beer was good. That was more of a transitory spot heading through, but definitely a place to visit. Afghanistan. Oh, God. Well, all over Afghanistan. I was there early in the Taliban last stand phase of 03. Kandahar ran up to Bagram quite a lot. It was uh, hot, then cold, lots of dust, uh, 10 months of boredom, about 10 seconds of terror on occasion. That's how that usually went down. Alaska. Yeah, too dang cold. That was more of a transitory spot. I, I play with a bunch of things that fly, and there's a lot of flying folks up there in, in Alaska. Uh, best memories there was not too many people, and that made me happy. Uganda. Jumbo, Jumbo. Uh, I spent more, most of my Africa time on the West Coast, but I did have a lot of Ugandans that worked for me, and they do actually speak some Swahili, and Akuna Matata is a real saying, and it means exactly what Disney said. Uh, I, I can't think of any other places. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> Greenland. Well, I've flown through Greenland a few times, and it's not green. That's an absolute lie. Iceland's actually the cooler place. Greenland, it's just rocks and ice. So what do you do? What's your deal? Well, that's the weird thing is uh, uh, I live by four simple rules, but my fourth one is why not? And that has taken me all over the world. I started a... a Kind of a gold, diamond, aluminum, or uh, iron ore prospecting company in, in West Africa with some on-demand air service. Was a, uh, Also got into air rescue and VIP flying there. Uh, before that, I did air shows and I played with Warbirds, uh, old World War II aircraft. And I'm just, just crazy. Uh, sailed across the Atlantic on a Polish tall ship, like a pirate ship, currently live on a sailboat. And right now I'm just a glorified ambulance driver in the sky. You're a glorified ambulance driver in the sky? What, is, uh, what does that entail? That's it. Well, it, I've got the easy job. Four poor guys in the back, those are the ones that work. I basically just take people that's broken, you know, put band-aids on them and send them to the boo-boo box. Huh. Um, when did you start traveling? Uh, pretty much right out of high school. Uh, I was fortunate pre-9-11, so I'm kind of old. Uh, got picked up for the Army high school to flight school program, but got hurt before finishing and went back to the work doing that government cheese stuff, and they sent me around the world a few times got tired of that went into my own contracting tried to be an entrepreneurial type and uh, that landed me uh, by sheer luck and, and and hillbilly wit 
met the right people in the right places and here I went to Africa. Then uh, after that, I was in the tuna fish business with helicopters uh, in Guadalcanal down in the South Pacific. Had a spot in Australia that was my support base and my favorite place was Ponape, Micronesia. That was uh, my second base for tuna field operation stuff. And, uh, you you did you had a tuna field operation in Ponape, Australia. Ponape, Micronesia. My support base was down not terribly far from Melbourne, Australia. It was just easy to get shipments in and out of there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And my other base was in Guadalcanal, which is the Solomon Islands. But my territory went from South America, Central America, all the way to Indonesia, to Korea, up towards Alaska, down to New Zealand. I've pretty much been to most every island nation there is in the Pacific during that that period of my life. Montana. What about Montana? Ah, Too damn cold. And they got some wicked skeeters that you'd never believe but man when the skeeter season hits up there and that marshy stuff uh, I, I ain't about it a lot of folks like it up there just because it's okay. partially populated but i have this thing I, it is absolutely against my religion to walk on water if i can walk on water <laughs> i have to seek a latitude more inclined to my personal beliefs oh by the way i am jewish by birth but i'm also a duty priest so that's been pretty handy going around the world because I've got to marry a couple of folks off, you know, in the interesting places. Why, what do you what do you explain what you mean by it's against your religion to walk on water? How so? Well, I figured there was only one guy religiously that was good enough to do that. So if water becomes solid, it is no longer a climate in which I can sustain myself. Therefore, I seek something much more inclined to like margaritas, sunsets, you know, feet on the beach, that, that kind Are of thing. Are you saying, so like, is it sacrilegious to walk on, to like walk on ice? Just for me. Okay. That's rule number three. It's only my business if I can walk on water or not. But if I so, can stand on solid water, it's too dang cold. So you started off Jewish and then you became, you said a dudist priest? What is that? Well, no, I was born Jewish. That, that's that's kind of different uh, that's that's a whole genetic thing i was never practicing but i do have a yarmulke and i can blend in on occasion but okay. uh, yeah no i've been through a whole lot of religions trying to find my place i've been through that wonderful latter-day saints they have some real interesting ideas out there but i might have been a little bit too much of a womanizer for for their particular inclination so they didn't want me to stick around too much i thought uh, that i thought that mormons have like a lot of wives well, that's only one group of them, uh, strangely enough. There is a group that is that way. And again, rule number three, that ain't my business what they do. But if they're happy doing that, that's them. But I found that it is awful dang hard for me to please one, much less multiple women. So I've, I, I have attempted and was unsuccessful. I've given that life up. Uh, so what is a Dudist priest? Oh, uh, well... Dudist priests, is, we just kind of follow the uh, the morals and ideas and the ways of the dude, which came from a great movie, which I shall not name just for copyright reasons. But uh, the idea is to be chill. Oh, this and, is all uh, from the big LeBron. Are you doing a bit right now? No, I'm not doing a bit right now. This is my actual real life. I'm telling you, I'm probably the that, that most interested man in the world commercial was modeled after me, and I just didn't know it. I have a question. Go ahead. How did you end up, like, how did you find me on Twitch and call me? How did you end up here? Well, strangely enough, my coworker here, uh, probably the most educated and talented paramedic in the world, he's a whole lot more than that, but, but he, he just fixes busted up people that I fly him around. But that being said, he is an avid follower of you. And we've been talking here for almost a year since this new base opened up. He goes, man, you have got to tell your story to the therapy gecko. I'm like, huh. what? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, well, put him on sometime. And I started listening to you myself. I'm like, yeah, that's some pretty cool stuff you got going on. But, I mean, if we really want to get out mind-blowing, you know, uh, 
any one of my numerous stories is mind blowing enough and absolutely unbelievable, but I got pictures to prove it. That's the only reason I probably haven't been burnt at the stake. So, um, where are you at in your religious beliefs now? I am what's called a, uh, a free agent. I, I've quite literally lived with every culture of the world. I mean, being American, you kind of default you grow up in, in the Christian faithhood, but I've had a hard time with that in my past because I've, I've went to numerous from the guys, you know, hang, handling snakes and stuff, a little bit too crazy for me. Even the Mormons, like I was saying, I uh, spent some time at the Jewish temple trying to find my way. I even uh, been through a whole lot of uh, Ramadans and uh, our good friends out, out in the Mideast hung out with them. Uh, and even crazy some Taos and Buddhists. And I could really dig the Buddhist way because that, that kind of fills towards the Buddhist priest way, you know, be chill, live within your means, and don't don't cause harm to others. But I just don't know. I can't say 100% where I fit in, and until that day comes, I'll just kind of be a free agent. What's your name again? Uh, I'm Mike. My old call sign, Marmy call sign, was Murdoch. That, that's uh, the crazy helicopter. Oh, right. It Murdoch. Came. Murdoch. Yep. All right, well, I'll call you Mike. Mike, uh, yeah, um... My- um, what's your what's your family friend situation? Who's who's around you in your life? Yeah, uh, uh, that that vagabond vagabond uh, side of me. I stay pretty much on the go. I have a, a couple of good close friends, but otherwise, I just have a world full of acquaintances. If that makes sense. Where are uh, you now? I am currently in a little town in South Central Illinois. And my, this, I'm real, real hillbilly from Tennessee. That, that's home and, base is Tennessee. And this guy that you are working with now is is uh, listens to the podcast and showed you this. He does very religiously, actually. That's why after okay. he was hearing some of my stories, which again totally unbelievable, he goes, "You have got to talk to the therapy gecko." And I just tried calling you 152 times, and finally it came through. So, um. All right, you have just acquaintances because of your vagabond life. Let me let me bring something up to you. I want to get your thoughts on it. Um, it. Going anywhere in the world, anytime you want, doing whatever you want all the time, no restrictions, nobody to tell you what you can and can't do, complete and other total freedom. Is that freedom? Or loneliness? It depends. If you're comfortable in your loneliness or comfortable being solitary and alone, then it's absolute freedom. Uh, I'd say humans are born to be somewhat social. I think we're a little too socialized now with all the social media stuff, which I believe is causing problems. But out there, one of my favorite places is uh, Micronesia, the, the island nation of Micronesia. Sparsely populated rainforest out on little islands throughout the Pacific. Uh, uh, a government came in, another, again, try not to get too detailed because you can connect too many dots, but uh, a supporting government bought them a bunch of fishing boats, big commercial fishing boats, and gave them to them and said, here you go. We, we want you to fish because other large nations around you are fishing up your fisheries. He goes, okay, that's a good idea. You can make a lot of money, a lot of wealth. And they took one boat out one time, fished for about three hours, brought it back, and they all sank. And this government came back and said, why the heck did you do that? That is ridiculous. Do you not understand that you could make tons of money and sit on the beach and never worry again and just watch the sunset. He goes, boss, we do that now. And that has pretty much what has led my life around the world is not ever worrying about acquiring wealth or a grand status. I just live for today. Head now, out. Well, but, well, so back to like the, the whole like social aspect 
of this. Do you not f- ever feel lonely or feel as though um, you you want to have a recurring network of people in your life, or is that something you've kind of abandoned? Well, it's never abandoned. I just never considered it. Um, I, I, I considered things more on a functional basis, and life for me, just following my my four simple rules was uh, made enough acquaintances and friends around the world that I never worried about it. But I was still perfectly content. I'd spent many months totally alone in an African jungle all by myself, just waiting on a rescue call and totally supporting myself independently. Nothing, no contact with the outside world other than a really expensive satellite data uplink. But that's another story. And I was absolutely content. Uh, I'd say I'm probably the most happy sitting on my sailboat just floating around on my own thoughts. I know that's probably weird for most, but that's just how I've always operated. Can I ask how old you are? I Yeah, absolutely. I am 41. And you've been doing this since you came out of high school? Yep, yep. Pretty much since graduation. I've uh, just had the travel bug and simply keeping myself frugal and uh, unattached to things has allowed me to go all over and uh, the whole key to that is is never saying "Ooh, maybe i shouldn't i never said that as long as it was within my means and i wasn't going into debt to do it why not rule number four and i struck out and how did you i mean basic stuff like the ability to eat and the ability to sleep in a place where you're not in danger how did well, you do those two times, things it was very dangerous areas but uh, another weird quirk, I guess, in, in the, the psychology, psychiatry, whatever, the, how people work is I always presented myself as very friendly, but not too friendly. Uh, I'm absolutely not a bad dude by any ways, but I can call a big bluff. So long as I, especially Africa was this way, because I, I, there, strangely enough, I was the minority and uh, had very, very good friends but there's also some bad actors there and i just made it known that this guy's probably a little too crazy to uh mess with and would not be worth our time so Mm -hmm. that's how i did that now there was some dangerous events that happened and i eventually due to the political problems going on in west africa decided it's best to leave because old ron tater salad said i don't know how many it would take to whoop my ass but i know how many they're going to use kind of deal and who is that, Ron? Who who is Ron Tater Salad? Oh, he's a comedian, Ron White. Oh, Very okay, old. I know who that is. Yeah, but uh, anywho, so yeah, I bounced and got out of there. Pretty much sold out of that business when the politics started getting real wild, and that's when I got into the tuna fish. So, like w- these places, like uh, like like certain parts of Africa and. Like the the Afghanistan and uh, you know anywhere else that maybe has a reputation of being like dangerous. What yeah. have you learned uh, about that danger? Uh, whether whether or not it is it is true to the rumor of itself. Um, it is not. There are places okay. right here in the states that I would consider far more dangerous than most of the third world nations I've been to, except for a few that are really politically heated right now. Uh, then you just use common sense. Uh, but yeah, I had a great time in Africa. It was it was wonderful. Great people. Uh, the uh, number of times I would have a bad situation, I feel, was far less than me being in a rough part of our our own country. And you know, uh, other than it being the third world and not having Walmart and Sex Fifth Avenue down the road or go to a McDonald's or Taco Bell, you kind of got to learn how to, to survive on their means and their economy. But uh, other than that, it, it was it was a great experience. There, so, uh, all over the Philippines was great. Australia, New Zealand even up north Canada, going into the Arctic, all over Europe, you, you name it. I even lived in downtown Paris for a while, but 
I really didn't like that. It was cool to visit for like a week. I stayed way too long and it just became annoying. And I understand why the folks in Paris get annoyed because it's way too many darn tourists there. Just bug you to death. So um, after having traveled everywhere in the world and having like meeting all these people and doing all these things, do you, are you bored? Are you like, ah, I already did everything and talked to everyone and you know, it's like you've 100% completed the game? Strangely enough, I was just talking with that's with my crew because uh, you know, what I'm doing is, is pretty much in game of helicopter flying. And I'm like, aren't you bored? I'm like, no, nah, you know, again, I, I'm not a manly man, but I got way too many holes punched in the man card. I just really enjoy today. I'm also a cancer survivor. I almost died of cancer three years ago, ironically, from toxic exposure in Iraq. And uh, that really changed my perspective. I was already a very outgoing and adventurous person. But after that, you know, I'm pretty much looking God in the face and with the doctors and staff and nurse all telling you, you need to make your peace with everything. I'm like, no, no, I'm going to walk out of here in about two weeks and I'm going to get back to it. And they're like, that's that's a great attitude. I'm like, no, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I did. And I walked out of there and got back to flying. You know, that was a bit of a, a hard thing to do post-cancer, but was able to do it and still kicking it. And I, I really legitimately enjoy every day. I tour around on a motorcycle, even have my own little YouTube channel. I'm not going to plug myself or nothing, but I, I travel all over the country doing what I do, ride my little motorcycle and camp in the woods or if I'm tired, I find a hotel and Everywhere I stop, I try to meet new people and hear their story. And that's what really drives me is, is just the sheer adventure of everything. It's not trying to gain wealth or build an empire. My most valuable stuff is my experiences and my memories. And uh, maybe one day a movie will be made about it. But uh, otherwise, I'm just content to be the hillbilly vagabond and just kind of tour around and say hi. Is your YouTube channel called The Hillbilly Vagabond? No, it's Murdoch, The Hillbilly Vagabond. That, that's the YouTube channel. But again, I'm not okay. trying to plug myself. I'm legitimately just wanting to, to, to talk to you because my good buddy here that follows you religiously has just been blowing me up for at least six months to make this phone call. So Murdoch, uh, with the cancer thing, uh, so so you had all these doctors and nurses look you in the face and tell you that you need to make uh, your peace with God and, you know, yeah. that you're going to die. And then you said, no, that's not what's happening. I'm going to walk that's out of right. here in two weeks. And you said it very confidently. What What's going on there? What gave what? you so much confidence in that moment? Let, let's go back to an earlier question, you, you, you know, where you were asking me, how, how did all of this come and I, I honestly believe there's something to speaking into existence or willing it to be because I, I don't dwell on anything negative. And it's everybody has it, you know, and you feel that little pit of anxiety in your stomach when something bad happens or something in the past that pops up like that little voice in your head that just kind of pops up. I yeah. literally tell that little voice to shut the hell up. Mm -hmm. And... I roll along and what I want to happen, I put it in my head. I literally envision the picture of what I want to happen. And I mm. try my best to will it to be. Uh, some people call it prayer. Some people call it, you know, magic. I don't know. I just, I think there's something to stopping and really thinking hard about what you want to do and mm. just simply believe in you can do it and you will do it there's no can't there's no maybe and when they were telling me you know you better start doing this the chaplain's coming down and i'm like no that's that's great i understand your concern that is legit it would not be wise for me to not go ahead and plan for things but i'm telling you in about two weeks i'll be walking out of here and i did huh and um you know have you ever uh, a lot of people would call what you would, would call what you're talking about, so, like to be manifesting. Yeah, um, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So, have you ever 
really tried to manifest something that didn't come true for you? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and again, it's all in the expectations. Uh, previous to this job, up until about 2015, I lived overseas almost exclusively. And long story short, uh, some things happened. I might or might not have had a little run in with 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 the uh, the tax collector, and that drastically altered my life after that. And I was quite resentful, you know, because I had worked really hard. And mind you, I, I, I was that statistical kid, you know, sing, single mom, straight out the single wide of in the darn hillbilly part of Tennessee, where most everybody would figure you're just going to be a tobacco farmer or something. And I just decided at that young age, I was going to do something about that. And I did. Became the youngest warrant officer candidate in the army at the time 19 years old in warrant officer candidate school unfortunately got hurt you know and that that ended my short army career but that still didn't stop me i kept pursuing my dream of flying and i turned that into every aspect of it flying airplanes flying helicopters i became a licensed mechanic then a federal inspector of aircraft added an aerospace engineering degree on top of that and built my own little niche empire by traveling around the world and setting up these operations in clandestine environments. And huh. that's just because I believed I could do it. But then again, the wonderful government decided that I needed to donate all that to the society for the betterment of everybody, which, you know, some people think is a good thing, or the redistribution of wealth. Uh, that made me angry for a little bit, but I got over it, got me this awesome job helping people again flying a, a glorified eight million dollar amber lamps in the sky and, hmm. and i've been really enjoying that and i've never looked back yeah I didn't so have a lot of time but you know so so you had you had this this business um and you were setting up like uh 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 it sounds too complicated for me to understand, but I'm going to try to put yeah. it in a place where I can understand it. You had this business where you were, like, setting up these aero... Uh, you were setting up plane... I'm gonna, you were doing airplane stuff Everything. in many Everything. different countries. Yep. And um, yep. eventually the tax collectors came, and yep. the tax collectors were like, hey, you owe us, like, a lot of money. And you yep. were like, oh, fuck. And so your business was basically destroyed... And yeah, then you had to get much. a real job, and well, now you're working your job job. I don't Is that really accurate? Real job. I mean, I'm getting paid to do some awesome stuff, so I can't complain. Uh, but, yeah, that's pretty much how it went down. And to, to be known, it was my fault. I was ignorant of the tax laws, so it's, it's not like I'm bashing stuff. I, I made a legit screw up, and and it's all, all done in the past, moved on, but since that point, I kind of lost that ambitious drive. That makes sense. Because I just more about that. live super happy just existing today and not worrying about building that empire for tomorrow. And I think a lot of us get caught up in that drive to try to prove that we're valuable by showing that we've accumulated stuff and money and things and i think that's really driving a lot of sadness in in today's world hmm. so you had this business it you you fucked up with the tax thing and the business was shut down and at yep. the time you were a very ambitious focused like let me build my empire let me build my status let me build my wealth yes and then all that got depleted, and then that kind of started you on the path to where you are right now, where you feel as though you're living more more for every day yep. itself. Yep. Sure enough. That's mm. pretty much how it went. I mean, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the simple way. But yeah, uh, still, okay. it's been a hell of a life. Uh, seeing the whole world many times over, uh, it, it just, I don't know. I, I sometimes how long, don't like it either. How long ago did this happen with the tax thing? Uh, that was 2015. Okay. That was when I, I was no longer the international man of mystery, and then I just 
turned into good old Murdoch, the Amber Lamps driver. And um, are you happier since that happened? Yeah. Yeah. There was, it was an unimaginable weight lifted off of me. I mean, when you have dozens and dozens of forward bases all over the world handling hundreds of employees, their visas, their paychecks, half of them at different countries knowing what currency they want to get paid in, uh, you know, uh, having these high attrition rates because a lot of places I work, most people wouldn't want to be. So, you know, you had to be real selective in hiring. Uh, most wouldn't last six weeks, you know, out in the middle of the Pacific on a stinky old fish boat or in West Africa. You know, most people are are very spoiled on their first world luxuries, we'll just say. So mm -hmm. it was it was a very stressful job. I did enjoy it because I felt you know, I was contributing to the world. But now, you know, looking back on it, it was a heck of an adventure, but I'm just darn happy to be alive today and talking to mm. the therapy gecko. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about what you're um, saying. It makes a hell of a lot of sense. I'm thinking about it in my own life, you know, because yeah. uh, I feel like I lose, I lose. One thing I really try to think about all the time is the fact that that life is such a it's so short and so it's um, short. Even the, it's unimaginably short. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got great mentors in their nineties. You know, in their mind, they're still thirty years old, twenty years old, and they can't believe it happened so fast. So that's mm -hmm. all. If I if I could impart anything, is as sad as everybody is in today's hyper-connected world is to just slow down a minute, breathe, turn all of that stuff off, and just enjoy you and your immediate surroundings for at least an hour or two a day. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. so much, it's hard to do because this stuff's addicting. It's it's probably the most addicting drug in the world, the old ticky talkies and the, and the YouTubes. Heck, I'm trying to cash in on it with my old YouTube experiment, but you know, I don't know. It, it's interesting how conversation always goes to. I had no idea what I was going to talk about other than crazy adventures, but it usually ends up being philosophical because that's the same question I get from anybody that ever asks about my crazy life is, is why. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't give you a why. I just did what made me feel happy. And I kept choosing a direction that I felt would make continue the happiness yeah yeah like i was saying i think uh i think about it in my own life um it's weird you know because i think what i do is has afforded me uh an opportunity to like go travel places and do things um and live these these adventures because everything that you're talking about that's important to you it's important to me too going on adventures yeah. and uh meeting people and whatnot but uh i think it's important to like kind of I don't know. Maintain, uh, maintain this, maintain sight of that, and to really keep in mind uh, just how short life is, and to yeah. let that be a significant. I mean, it's really, really important thing to think about every day, and and have guide your uh, your your choices. Yep. You know, way too many people don't. Don't, and I mean by don't, I mean everything. They just don't because of that fear of, well, what if this or what right. if that, you know, right. and just lose out. I, just, I went, my, my four simple rules, these are my rules. I didn't get them from anybody else. I just made them up about 20 years ago as I live off Wait, of Wait, this isn't I, from the Big Lebowski, is it? No, this is my own. This is my okay. own stuff. Uh, the the dude thing, it, it was just something funny that I got into. And uh, anyway, that is a whole other story. But live off of what you earn. If I did not earn it, I don't deserve it. That just basically means there's a lot of people that's been really well off out there. I just try never to be jealous of what they have, you mm -hmm. know. And rule number three is the most important rule. Uh, you, you, skipped, you skipped rule number two. 
Rule number two is if you didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Rule number one is I live off of what I earn. So I try not to go into debt for things. Oh, okay. You know? All right. I didn't realize that, that was a, that was kind of a hard to do. Okay, rule three. That's the most important. Most important rule is mind your business and demand those around you mind theirs. That is a hard one to do. But, you know, the key to being yourself is don't get yourself tangled up in other people's business you know mm. uh, always try to do good never do harm but at the end of the day don't go poke your nose in somebody else's stuff the same way they you should tell others not to get involved in your business and then uh, number four is the fun rule so long as rule one two and three are satisfied that is why not it's not what if, that is why not. You get an opportunity that comes up and it satisfies one, two, and three, then by all means, give it a shot. Don't do a what if, go a why not, you know? I like that. And you never know where that's going to take you. I like that. I like that. Um... Yep. Belgium. You ever been to Belgium? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I pretty much did the whole European tour. And honestly, the best way to do it is by train. But I never lived there, so I can't give you the context of, like, culture other than that that edge of Europe, you know. Uh, hmm. the cool Murdoch! Thing about, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, you go ahead. The cool thing about finish. Europe is... is Everybody thinks here in America, you know, as America, the borders around us, America is huge. You go to Europe from basically St. Petersburg, Russia, all the way to Lisbon, Portugal is not nearly as big as the U.S. And all it takes is a few hour transit time. And you're in a totally different country with totally different cultures, totally different languages. And they've been there for thousands of years. It's definitely worth seeing, and I would recommend if you do it, do it on the train. Hmm. Murdoch, the Hillbilly Vagabond. That's me. And that's your YouTube channel as well? It is, yep. Old Murdoch okay. came up from my army days because I was a crazy kid that could fly everything. And what's funny was here years later, I read the bio for the character Murdoch from the A-Team, and it's literally me, even though I'm hmm. younger than... You know, 18 was out in the 80s, which was my young childhood days. But the bio for Murdoch is ridiculously identical to who I am. Hmm. Well, I have a couple final questions. What, what do you feel like you learned about humanity through all of your trials, your travels? All right. Well, this was going to get deep. All right. Hit me. What I've learned about humanity is no matter what race, what religion, what culture, where you've grown up, where you were born, where you've traveled to, for the most part, everybody laughs and cries to the same thing. Yeah. Another thing I've learned about humanity is that as individuals, most people tend to be good. You know, if I was in any country of the world and I'm just one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, you know, we immediately can get along, have a good time. The yeah. caveat is what I call tribalism. And this is where things go downhill fast. And that is when you have any group of people who identify more with their group and then disregard any other group, you always have problems. And that's yeah. everything from race, religion, culture, where you're born in the world. That tribalism is what's causing so many problems today is because they, we can't just live to be me. Sure. We have to be part of some group. And my group, by golly, is better than your group. And it always starts a conflict where every individual person, even in the middle of war, you know, I've been in terrible war zones and had the most enlightening enlightening conversations with who's supposed to be my enemy mm. you know and we 
are the greatest of friends. But tomorrow, once he is back part of his group, it will be his job to kill me. Mm. And I just could never subscribe. That's why I consider myself a free agent. I don't belong to any group. I am just me. I am the old hillbilly named Murdoch. And I'm just here to meet people, continue my own adventure, and mind my business. And hopefully, you know, I can help somebody else along the way. And uh, when you die, Murdoch, when your adventure comes to an end, where do you, what do you think happens? That all depends. I'm probably going to go out like a legend. So when they put me in the box, if there's uh-huh. a box, if they could even find me, because who knows where I'm going to be when I finally check out. But I definitely want, if that's the situation, folks to come up, look at me, and absolutely shudder. I, I want them to, like, gasp and say, that guy lived one hell of a life and it can tell i can see you know rough but you know that's just because i have earned that right to have such a crazy ass life and the adventure that i've I've gone through but most likely i'll never be found because i probably am going to check back out of society in a few years get back on my boat and start going I've, i've almost made it all the way around the world on a sailboat i've still got the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean left. So once I check out, you know, I might do a Facebook post and occasional upload to my YouTube channel of what I'm doing. But that's pretty much the only contact I'm going to have with first world society after that. But do you do you have any thoughts about, uh, I don't know, the like, do, do you believe in a life after death, like a heaven or oh. a hell or a reincarnation yeah. or a... I, I can't tell you what it is, uh, what that's going to be, but they, just the scientist in me, 100%, you cannot create nor destroy energy. So we have to transmit from one so, something to another. There is yeah. no way you can destroy any kind of, of uh, memory. Uh, there's another word for it, but basically... Uh, information can't be destroyed once it's created. Whatever your soul is, you know, just believe exactly what you want to believe that there is something sure. else because that definitely gives you peace at the end. I'm, if I check out tomorrow, I'm absolutely at peace with that. But uh, uh, what what religion might be correct, I, I can't answer that. But I have been around enough people who have died in my presence and i don't mean that in a weird way it's just something else i've been through to almost feel kind of an energy when they die and it's that's a whole nother story i could go down Uh, it's a big rabbit hole on the philosophical side i also have an honorary degree in metaphysics uh phd actually in metaphysics so i i do a lot of deep thought around there Mm. And still, I can't say where I fit into it. So, but I absolutely do think, believe, I can't say I know because I can't possibly know, but I believe that when we leave this realm, we're starting a new adventure. I just don't know what it is. You know, I've always, I was talking to my friend about this. When I die, I kind of don't want to be put in like a box. Like, th- just yeah. throw me in the dirt, right? Because yeah. I do, I agree with what you said. The the energy, it, like, uh, it has to go somewhere. And I feel like if I die in a box, I'm not leaving the box. Throw me in the dirt so the ants can yeah. eat me. And then I can, I can like, become ants or That's something. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, you know, the, it, who we are, in my belief anyway, is just the energy contained in the body the body is just our robot that we control you know basically so when you leave and the body quits working that was just you know it's just now a used car that don't work anymore (laughs) kind of if that makes sense no it does i i do i do have that feeling about uh you know we're just like renting our bodies yeah that's why i i i have this big the thing I'm going through and thinking about of like uh, everyone being each other and like I'm all bad things and I'm all good things because we all come from the same whatever. Oh, absolutely. You know. um, yep. We go scientifically, we are 100% made in the supernova of a star. We all started at 
as I'm not a believer in the Big Bang. That's a whole other thing I can go down uh, scientifically anyway. But everything we are in every rock, every tree, everything around us, you, me, everybody is made starting from hydrogen that was fused into helium, fused into heavier elements that only came about through the death of a supernova star. And somehow we all kind of swirled around, gravity pulled everything together, and then we organized into what we call life. And there's religious aspects to that. You know, I, I can't fathom how many different things it came to be, how many coincidences for matter to start reproducing and turn into a sentient life, you know, so that's the philosophical side but that's what bugs me so much of everybody that can't get along and i know that's been said to ad nauseum but we're literally built of the same crap why do we gotta fight ah <sighs> well murdoch the tra the hillbilly vagabond this has been a nice uh it's been a nice time talking with you man i really do appreciate it you're hitting on stuff that i've been you know, thinking about him in my personal life a lot. So it's it's good to get to chat with you. You've inspired me to, um, you know, look beyond my my immediate, both look beyond my immediate surroundings for more adventure, and also the 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 opposite of just uh, like you said, trying to to sit within them. Um, yeah, and yeah, look for adventure there. Is there anything that you want to say to the people at the computer before we get out of here? No, nope. just live for today. Don't worry about everything going on around you. Live for today. Try to find one thing in your immediate surroundings every day that makes you happy. And instead of worrying about bills and taxes and medical problems, just for that little bit of time, just think of how lucky you are to have that one little piece of happiness and, and enjoy it. And then, while doing that, try to think and manifest, as you'd say, what you would sure. want to be better tomorrow. And that's it. Don't don't go two years from now. It only works for a few days at a time. Anytime you try to, to really push for that long term, there's it's just too much. Just just be I'm, happy. Uh, I'm looking at a roll of paper towels right now, and. Um... Hey, I've decided. You, you, I've decided you, that I'm not going to pay my taxes. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, I can tell you uh, the uh, outcome of that if you would like to know. Uh, it's probably not too pleasant. I think but... I can. I think I think I can guess. Well, um, yeah. well, Murdoch, thank you very much, man. Uh, I appreciate you talking to me for so long, and um, I'll have to check out your your YouTube channel. Thanks for sharing Absolutely. all this stuff with us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Take care, man. Yes, sir. I liked I liked Murdoch. Um, he made me think about a lot of things. He brings up two th interesting things, which is uh, finding adventure by traveling to every single country in the world and talking to as many people as you possibly can, and uh, you know, going super super loco crazy mode. Uh, and then the opposite of that, which is. Um, can you find the satisfaction that you would find going super loco crazy mode traveling to every country in the world by sitting in the chair that you're sitting in right now, staring at a roll of paper towels and going, what a crazy thing it is to just be alive looking at a roll of paper towels. And I believe in both of those. So um, I'm going to keep staring at this roll of paper towels and uh, appreciating what an honor it is to be doing that this episode's brought to you by uh, bounty paper towels call from Anthony Anthony talk to me oh hell what I actually got connected you did what's up all right I've got a few things I want to talk to you about first what's your opinion on Klondack bars I used to be obsessed with Klondike bars, man. They used to have this uh, Reese's flavor. Uh, and, and I think it was like, it was the actual, no, but, dude, no, they used to have this like Reese's Klondike that was in the shape of a Reese's cup. 
That was bomb. I love Klondike bars. Bro. Are you about to Funny ask me what I would do for one? Because if you do, I'm going to hang up on you. No, no, no. But, like, bro, oh, my God. The other day, I bought Reese's uh, Klondike bars. Um, You ever had a Choco Taco? I have heard it's of it. Say, it's by oh, yeah. it's by it's part of the Klondike family. I have not. I gotta look for it next time I go to work. <laughs> well, no, I think they just I think they were discontinued. That might have oh, actually shit. just been a market. That might have, that might have just been like a PR stunt. I'm pretty sure I've been in like uh, convenience stores and seen them around recently. But I feel like there's a greater reason why you're asking me these questions. But I also now that I now that that came out of my mouth, I'm realizing that there probably is not. I've just been like real in the Klondike bars recently. I know exactly what you're talking about. I had a Klondike bar phase where I was going to the grocery store and buying them, and they were like a part of my life for a little bit. I don't remember what Bro, that all. So I work at a food line, right? Uh-huh. And uh, one of my customers that I was uh, serving had told me that there was like a two for six deal. On like uh like six packs of Klondike bars, I bought four packs. So I've been chowing down. So that was twelve. Yeah. What can you do? You have any Klondike bars with you right now? Um, no, but I do have a wrapper next to me because, like, I just need one. What's the most amount of Klondike bars you've eaten in one day? Uh, probably the other day. I think I ate like four while I was playing Overwatch. That sounds like it would hurt. No, I mean, like, it was like over like an hour. Mm. What do you do? What do you do with your life outside of Klondike bars? Outside of Klondike bars? Well, um, yeah. I'm currently going to college. So there's okay. that. I mean, work. Uh, when I'm not doing either of those, I really just uh, play video games. Mm. You want to hear my fucking diet freshman year of college? It was awful. Go it was it. um, it was I would take ramen, chicken. What what's the name of the brand? Mari Mari Marishiana or Mara whatever the whatever you know what I'm talking about. I would take that brand of ramen, Mar- Maruchan Maruchan ramen. Oh, I would put some butter. In the noodles. And then for dessert, I would have sprinkled donut Cap'n Crunch. It was ramen and sprinkled donut Cap'n Crunch, man. Shit ruined my life. Oh my god, after I'm done recording this, I'm gonna go get some sprinkled donut Cap'n Crunch. I wonder if they still make it. <laughs> Dude, I never... I know I know that you're addicted to Klondike bars now. And <laughs> I think it was shortly after my Klondike bar phase that I got into Sprinkled Donut Captain Crunch. Do me a favor. Never, never try Sprinkled Donut Captain Crunch. Don't do it. It will ruin your life. St- I feel as though I still, my teeth still hurt from bowls of Sprinkled Donut Captain Crunch that I ate when I was a freshman in college. Don't ever eat that stuff. Yeah, I really don't do cereal too much. And when I do, it's like Raisin Bran. Oh, so you're better than everyone else. I wouldn't go that far. I just try to eat healthy. But you thought, you know, you thought I was being sarcastic just now as being a completely and utterly genuine. <laughs> you are better than everyone else for not eating. Eating sprinkled donut Captain Crunch makes you less of a person. I will defend that statement. I fully believe that. I did not feel Every like a human was putting that stuff in my mouth. Every goes away. Say that one more time. Is that every bowl a piece of your soul goes away? What's your name? Uh, Anthony. Anthony. Anthony, how long do you think I have left to live? Um, am I allowed to know your age? Yeah, I'm 25. All right, 25. Hmm. I say you've got either 20 or 40 years left in you. Depending on your diet and Do you exercise. think I only have fuck, you think I only have twenty years left to live? You know what the sad part is? You might be right. I, would you really think I only have twenty years left to live? But like I don't know like your whole daily routine. So I can't properly discern 
when you might croak. If you do, it, the answer would probably go down to 15. How long do you think you have left to live? Um, I'm only 19. I try to live relatively healthy. You just, ate, you just told me you ate four Klondike bars in an hour. Yeah, but like, I work out. I eat healthy for the oh, most part. Oh, so you think you're better than everybody else. I mean, yeah. Because you are. Because eating healthy and working out and living a healthy lifestyle does make you better than everybody else. I'm not saying that to be a dick. I'm saying that fully, sincerely. I think you are a better person than I am. In certain ways, yes. But What's your name not. again? Anthony. Anthony. But before we go, what's your dream in life, man? Oh, this would be kind of cliche, but like, no matter where I am, I just want to feel like I'm at peace with my situation. Stable, happy, content. Oh, so you think you're better than everyone else because you are, because that's a great goal to have in life. I actually have one more question for you. Yeah, what's up? Hit me. So... What do you do for, like, income outside of therapy, Echo? Or is that, like, your sole pursuit in life? I beg for money under the Brooklyn Bridge. You know what? I can respect that. Thank you very much for calling, sir. No problem. You have a good night. And I make a damn good living doing it. <laughs>